have arrived at the final act of the story. We've gone book by book through the Bible, chapter by chapter, and we are now at the final pages. Last week we saw in the letters that God in the in-between, between Jesus' resurrection and his return, has shepherded us with plenty of life-giving words. He hasn't left us to figure it out on our own. Thank the Lord. And we're going to see a similar theme today as we open the book of Revelation. Seven weeks, we're going to take through it with the seven visions to get an overview of how the story ends and why it matters for us today. Now, originally, we're just going to do one week in Revelation, right? And then we we thought, no, we need to kind of expand this. We need to zoom in a little bit to this book that is, it's a tough one to tackle, right? And it's often so misunderstood and it's often totally avoided. Uh, I talked with many of you all this week. Hey, how are you feeling about Revelation? Uh, And the reality is very few of us know it. Very few of us understand this book, and very few of us are even excited to learn about it, if we're honest. I think there's a lot of reactions to Revelation, and so sometimes we think of Revelation a little bit like this. It's confusing, okay? Right? There's this impossible math problem on the board, and I'm not really good at Rubik's Cubes or things like that. I'm not a code cracker, and so we kind of pull ourselves out. I don't want to decipher this puzzle. Uh, Maybe that's not it. Maybe for you, Revelation is just strange, right? Like the uh, red-lipped batfish here. Yeah? Uh, Pretty odd, right? Pretty weird creature. Yeah, that's, Revelation's full of those, like, strange creatures. What's going on here? Prophecy, dreams. It's just out there, and it makes me uncomfortable. Maybe because it's a bit strange, too, then number three, Revelation to you is scary, right? You guys remember this show back in the day? Like, oh my goodness. Like, it talks about judgment and hell, and there's Satan's a dragon, and death, and end times. I think I'd rather just lay in a vat of bees or something, or snakes covering me. Like, that might be better than plunging into Revelation. It's scary. Some of us view Revelation, I think, number four, as exclusive. Okay? Kind of like Leo. Like, you got to have your seminary degree, all your credentials. It's for us professional Christians, right? And so unless you uh, have all the credentials there, unless you're, you know, a high-influencing, uh, you know, Christian blogger or something out there, then Revelation just isn't for you. There's no way I'll understand it, so I'll leave that to those people. Number five, Revelation sometimes it, to people is ethereal, right? <laughs> It's just kind of dreamy and out there, like Bob painting his happy little clouds, right? Uh, isn't that nice? It's so mystical, it's so fun, but it's intangible. Revelations is impractical, like give me the commands. I want James, I want Proverbs, none of this poetic imagery, dreamy type stuff with prophecy. No, give me the concrete. I like math, not Monet's. Application, not revelation, right? Maybe to you, Revelation is futuristic, right? Like, okay, if we can hop in the DeLorean and go back a little bit, uh, yeah. But it's so far distant, it's out there. Like, that's great, but it's way away from here. And so you just kind of feel detached from it. What difference does it make to right now, to today, to my life? You ever heard the phrase, so heavenly minded, there's no earthly good? We kind of chalk that up and it almost feels like Revelation is a distraction Maybe revelation to you is unimportant, number seven. It's kind of like that fourth place participation ribbon, right? Like, ah, uh, didn't quite make the cut of significance. Like, that's nice, good try, revelation. But with all my time that I have, you didn't quite make the podium, right? I have other things, and I'm doing just fine without you. And last but not least, revelation is, ugh, debated, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's controversial. Are people always arguing about Revelation and what it means and all these different interpretations and camps? And listen, I got enough of that in my life, right? I don't need another Twitter war on Sunday morning. I want to escape that. And especially those of us in the room who are harmonizers, we hate this. Oh, there's an argument? I'm out, right? I'm out. Just let you guys do your debating on your own. And so, For whatever reasons out of those, we don't read it. We tend to not read it. We avoid it. We maybe skim the surface, but that's about it. Take our coffee mug verses, slap those on, and then move on. I think 95% of us avoid it. 
And the 5% of you in here that don't, you're geeking out this morning, right? <laughs> like you've been waiting six years for this. Why are we only doing seven weeks? Come on, right? I know who you are. I know who you are. So confession real quick, I've been slow to sink my teeth into Revelation. If you were to ask me weeks ago, hey, what's the one book in the Bible you know the least about? I would say Revelation. Uh, I've studied it some, but a bit at a distance. And so uh, I think I fell into some of those Revelation hesitations. But I could tell you this morning, no more. No more. I'm eager today to preach Revelation. I'm eager to hear I'm eager to learn. I feel like a little child coming to Jesus to be discipled. Yes, Lord, I want to know you more. And I have been persuaded that these words, y'all, are his words. And listen, he doesn't speak wasted words. I'm persuaded that this book is meant to strengthen us. It's meant to establish and comfort and challenge us. And I am ready. It's not only, I'm persuaded, understandable, but it's necessary to your life and vitality. That without revelation, we are nutrient deficient spiritually. These are indispensable truths that you and I need to cling to as we hold fast and await Jesus' return. These 22 chapters are worthy of our full engagement. And we're going to see that from the first three verses. So open it up to Revelation. It's at the end. You'll find it pretty easily. And I want us to see the first three verses are going to answer many of these hesitations and reservations. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Out of the gate, John says this is a revelation. Now, the thing about revelation is what? It's meant to be revealed. It's meant to be, do you hear the word, made known, right? To show it. This is a testimony, a witness. This is not like the German Enigma machine. In World War II, you know that story about the code that was uncrackable? That's not this, just waiting for a mastermind to try to understand and decipher it. No, the purpose is to reveal to uncover, not to hide. God's not hiding truth. He's opening to it as he's pulling back the curtain of unseen realities. And I know, I get it. It's still hard to understand. You're like, yeah, this seems sometimes more like scenes out of Lord of the Rings than actual history. Yes, that's because it's prophecy and a lot of it is apocalyptic. There's future realities. It's challenging with imagery and metaphor. Yes, I get it. And especially challenging because, listen, most of us aren't used to using our imagination when we read scripture or in life, period, right? And so this is going to develop and stretch us a bit, but it's not a secret puzzle. Jesus is communicating, and he wants us to understand what he is saying. And notice, the central point of the book, the central content of the book reinforces that. It's a revelation of what? Jesus Christ. He's the main content. He's he's the one doing the revealing, but he's also the one being revealed. The the main subject of the book is ultimately showing us who Jesus is, which, by the way, is why this matters and why it's not irrelevant. It's also why that even though we might debate smaller things, the timing of things, the symbolism of things, at the end of the day, as Christians, we can all agree to keep the main thing the main thing. This is a revelation of Jesus. Jesus. This is about Jesus. And so it's not going to, it shouldn't mark, we shouldn't be marked by debate as we read Revelation. We should be marked by worship. Number two, though, do you see the word, who's it written to? To show his servants. So Jesus has given this revelation through a messenger, through an angel to John. But John's not the end recipient. He's a conduit. Where's this going? Servants. We're going to see the seven churches in Asia, which is a, a Roman province in modern-day Western Turkey, okay? So real, actual churches who were enduring persecution and living in hard days. Now, notice the audience is what? Not the pastor. Not apostles, right? Not spiritual special forces. The audience is regular, ordinary church members. You, Christians, This is written 
for you. And you go, well, it's actually written to the seven churches. Well, true, but seven throughout the Bible, and throughout Revelation in particular, is going to be a symbol for completeness, for wholeness. And so even as it says the seven churches in Asia, there's more actual churches in that province, like Colossians, Trojans. Those aren't mentioned here. And so the point of the seven is going, hey, this is indicative of the whole, the complete, all the church, period, in all time, period. This is written to believers then and written to believers now. It's understandable and it's for you. Number three, it matters. Notice, did you see the things that must soon take place? The time is near, right? Did you notice also these words could be heard, but who keep what is written? So you can keep these words? Oh, okay, there. You practical, command-loving, left-brain people in here who just want James, there you go. There's things for you to keep and obey in this book. It's not just ethereal and in the clouds. It matters, and it matters right now, not just way in the future. Do you hear the present tense? Read, hear, keep in real time so that you and I might be strengthened with faith, hope, and love as we endure harsh realities of this world. See, lest we forget where this story is heading, this is why Revelation is right. Lest we get lulled into living for the world right now, that's where Jesus is going to pull back the curtain. All right, number four, there is a wonderful, beautiful promise for us. Did you see that blessed is the one who hears, reads, and keeps it. Reminds me of the in- invitation out of the opening of the psalm, Psalm 1. Blessed is the one, right, who delights in the law of the Lord, who sinks their spiritual roots into the word of God. It's like a tree planted by streams of water, right? The same kind of idea here. Blessed is the one who really delves into this. And the word blessed, I love this word. It's such a special word in the Greek. It's not the normal for happiness. It's not euphoria. It's makarios. Makarios is this type of deep, unfazed joy, wholeness, unstealable kind of peace that's only found in God. Unfazed kind of satisfaction, that is makarios, which makes sense, right? Like the whole Bible that we've been doing for 43 weeks now, it's what? It's headed in this direction. It's pointed to this climax, Don't you want to know what's in this? Like, the whole of our faith is staked on this. We should want to know where this is all going, right? So I I hope that you're eager in wanting to understand this. There is a blessing in doing so. Uh, Nancy Guthrie, I'm going to just steal what she says. She says it this way. Revelation shows us the opposition we can expect to escalate, the endurance we need to cultivate, the judgment we will celebrate, the victory in which we will participate, the enemy Jesus will annihilate, the sorrow he will alleviate, the creation he will regenerate, the marriage he will consummate, the whole we can anticipate. That's what I call blessed. Yeah. Don't you want that blessing? (laughs) I do. And I'm eager. I'm eager to jump in. So let's keep going. We're just going to see the letters opening in verse 4. And five, the author of the letter, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you at peace from, from three cinders. So we'll see if you notice. From him who is and who was and who is to come. Oh, okay, that's a pretty awesome title. That's God the Father, right? Uh, Yahweh out of Exodus 3, the one who simply is, who's past, who's present, who's future. He is eternal reality, God the Father, but not just God the Father, God the Spirit. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Seven spirits, that's a little weird. Again, seven means what? Whole, complete. And so this is the Holy Spirit just symbolizing and helping us see his omnipresence. He's all present. The presence of God, but not just from the Father and the Spirit. Who's going to take center stage? It is God the Son. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. Three things about Jesus out of the gate, right? He's true. He's one. He's king. (laughs) Those are some exciting things and things that we are going to need to hold on to in this book. And now that truth is applied to us 
to him, Jesus, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Sounds like the gospel, doesn't it? And made us a kingdom in so doing by his death on the cross. He's made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. That's Exodus 19, y'all. Kingdom and priest. Jesus has fulfilled our purpose. Our purpose out of Genesis to be a, a kingdom, to be a part of his dominion, and his purpose out of Exodus in saving us, to be priest, to be access to his presence in the Holy of Holies, all accomplished in the gospel by Jesus. He's fulfilled it. Now, this is important out of the outset to recognize. A, a book, Revelation, that we think is kind of out there, right? Kind of weird. And where is it starting? In the really simple, clear centrality of the gospel, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is not some off his rocker, 90-year-old John with some quacky visions, right? <laughs> this is saying the same thing that the rest of the Bible is saying. The death the resurrection of Jesus is central to the message. Verse 7, we move from what Jesus has done to what he's going to do. Behold, Jesus is coming with the clouds. And when he does, every eye will see him. It will be unmistakable, y'all, to the whole planet. Even those who pierced him, even his enemies, and all the tribes on the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Beginning and end, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. I am the glorious beginning of history and the glorious fulfillment of history. I am sovereign over all things and I will fulfill my purpose that I lay out in this book. Wow, what a start. Now, here comes the first vision where we'll focus the rest of our time today. Vision number one starts in verse nine. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is John, one of the 12 disciples, right? Peter, James, and John, there he is. This is that John, and it's later in his life, pretty late in life, and he is on the island of Patmos, exiled there. Why was he exiled there? Under the reign of Domitian, the emperor in the 80s and 90s, there was an increased persecution of the church. And you can imagine the Apostle John's going to be a top target, right? In fact, he was the only apostle at the time, the only one of the 12 disciples who's still alive. All the other had already been martyred. And you go, wow, how did John escape? Well, they tried to martyr him. Legend has it through some historians like Tertullian that he was thrown in a boiling cauldron of oil and obviously survive. <laughs> so if you can't boil the dude to death, what do you do? You throw him on an island, right? And exile him with the rest of your prisoners. And that's what Rome did. It was kind of their ancient Alcatraz. Let's throw them, these people on this island and make them produce through hard labor. So John, here he is, probably hovering around 90 years old, and yet God preserves him alive because revelation still had to be given and written. Verse 10 and 11. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, meaning as he's praying, there's a conscious awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. This was a distinct day. This wasn't a normal prayer time. Something different's happening. It was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. All right, verse 12. Let's see that loud voice, voice like a trumpet. This was what we... Saw so read earlier, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. On turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, which are, he's going to say later represent the churches, the seven churches. And in the middle of his church, who is there walking, standing in the middle of his church? Jesus himself. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. Ah, you guys remember that phrase? Jesus used it of himself all the time. It's a phrase coming from Daniel 7, one like a son of man. In other words, one who looks human. <laughs> he looks human, but it's like a son of man. He's like human, and yet there's some distinctions also. Human-like, but, but notice a couple of things that are a little different. One like a son of man, he's clothed with a long robe, representing his priestliness. One with a golden sash around his chest, representing his kingliness. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. This is his 
omniscience, his infinite wisdom. His eyes were like a flame of fire. He sees and knows accurately all things. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. He's sovereign. He stands over all things. He's a firm foundation and he's ready to crush enemies and judge with justice in the final battle. Out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword ready to speak truth, ready to cut away what is false, ready to build up and give life with what is right and true. And from his face was like the sun shining in full strength, this light radiating, holy, brilliant, exposing the darkness. Wow, what a picture. Jesus in his divine glory on full display to see his beauty and his brilliance just staring at you right there. This is a picture of Jesus' supremacy and it is fundamental to the point of revelation, right? A revelation of Jesus. That's it right here. This is what the church needs to see. This is what you and I need to see. And when you do, it is jaw-dropping. Look at verse 7. John is jolted. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. (laughs) Right, like Moses, like Isaiah, like the Old Testament prophets, like the disciples when they see the transfiguration. When you rightly see the glory of God, there's really only one response. You willingly, gladly, humbly fall before him in his lordship. He goes limp on the ground as Jesus is pulling back the curtain and showing him the, the Superman behind the Clark Kent, right? Like, here's who I really am. It's what every knee will do one day when Jesus does the same and removes our blinders. And it is very interesting to me that John here does this. Listen, John walked with Jesus for three years, remember? John ate with Jesus. John slept beside Jesus. John knew what Jesus looked like, right? And yet here, John is prostrate before him. Listen, he's not John's homeboy. And he's not John's bro, he's his Lord. And in his glory, he is worthy of our absolute worship and allegiance. And yet, despite that picture, look what the Lord himself does. As he falls on his feet as though dead. But this sovereign Lord laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. <laughs> He gently restores John with his touch. This high and mighty king stoops low to his people to lift them up. That is our Jesus. And behold, he says, I'm the living one, the last, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forever. Catch this. And I have the keys of death in Hades. (laughs) Now that is a statement, y'all, right? You picture that? He's plundered death and hell itself, and he holds the keys. Therefore, why would you and I fear? He's defeated death. He's triumphed over them in the cross, Colossians says. Wow, what a picture of Jesus. And therefore, verse 19, write the things that you have seen. In other words, this vision right here in these verses, write what you have seen. Write also those that are So the things that I'm going to show you and the things that are to take place after this. Past, present, future. Write these categories down. What is in the past, what is present, which is chapter two and three, and what is to come. Jesus is reassuring John and he's gonna reassure his church next. Revelation two and three. We could probably preach sermons on each of the seven churches, but there's letters to each of the seven churches churches. Do you remember what it was like to get a report card when you grew up in school? Remember those? Did you dread those? I don't know how those went. Like, you know, you had the categories and the columns and the different, you know, subjects and you got that. If you don't remember what that's like, if you're a grown adult, you've gone to a physical with a doctor, like, I don't know, sometime in the last five years, right? And you're like, oh, how's this going to go? I'm going to get the evaluation of my health. That's kind of like what these letters are, right? All these seven churches and their different situations and circumstances are about to get an evaluation from Jesus, okay? He's going to give them the positives and the negatives, the pros and the grows 
uh, except it's more like pros and no's. Like he's pretty strong about his accommodation, but he's also strong with his correction. And Jesus is going to speak into these things. And it all kind of take a similar formula if you read through these. So number one, there's a description of Jesus. Number two, there's a diagnosis of their condition. Okay, so something about Jesus that we just saw in the vision is going to relate to what this church needs. Then there's a diagnosis. Here's where you're strong. Here's where you're weak. Then third, there's a direction. Like here's what you need to do. (laughs) Here's I'm calling you to action. And then there's fourth, a discipline. If you disobey, here's the warning and the consequence. And then there's fifth, a declaration of promise for those who do obey. Now, we're going to just fly by these. I can't plunge into each one. I'm going to give you an overview. But as we do, the whole goal, what I'm hoping and praying for you today is that you hear these and you go, which am I? What is my spiritual report card saying? What is the Lord Jesus speaking to me today? Let's kind of see this, okay? Because as it says in the end of each letter, it says, let him who hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the point is, don't just hear what Jesus is speaking to you. You need to hear all seven of these letters and learn from, from them collectively, okay? So let's do that. Let's plunge in, and I'm going to kind of give you the high-level synopsis. Church number one, Ephesus, where we'll be in the fall and spring, the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently. Good job, Ephesians. You're bearing up for my name's sake, and you haven't grown weary. Well done. Boy, that's exciting. They hate false teaching and the damaging, destructive effects that it causes. They're, they're not abandoning the faith in the midst of suffering. They're staying steadfast. All these positive things. But verse 4, I have this against you. Uh Uh-oh. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Well, that's piercing, isn't it? You don't love me and you don't love others like you used to. You've stopped your selfless and compassionate care for other people and you've lost your heartfelt devotion and enjoyment of me. That agape love. This is really relational language. I think you need to think husband and wife who have grown cold over time. The relationship is distant. There's affection that's lacking. Yes, Ephesians, you're strong on truth. You're strong on doctrine. But you're weak in love. Oh, you know your Bible. You're vigilantly defending the faith. But your love for Jesus has faded. You've missed the one who's standing in the middle of the church at the end of the day, the one who's central. You've missed his presence. Where's your relationship with me? He said, wow, what a warning for us. Maybe that's you today. Maybe this is you. I've lost the love I once had. I've grown cold. Remember, he says, look at the remedy here. Verse five, remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Remember the love you used to have. (laughs) Go back to the days where you had affection for me and others rekindle that and repent and do the works you did at first. If you don't, I'm going to come to you and remove your lampstand. You will not be a church anymore because, listen, you can have all the truth and doctrine you want, but if you lack love, then you're missing the gospel. And I won't let you continue. It's that serious, he says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. To the one who conquers, I will grant Listen to this, verse 7. To eat, here's the promise, if you endure, if you rekindle that love for God, you will be granted to what? To eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. Whoa. Do your ears shoot up on that one? Yeah, Genesis, right? One, two, tree of life. We haven't seen that in months. And here we are, and God is promising this again. What has been separated and severed from us in our sin, God is saying, I'm in open access again to life. I'm recovering Eden, right? That's what's happening in the story. The beginning and the end is merging. Wow. Well, the other churches are going to follow a similar pattern. I'm going to sum them up 
one by one. Church number two is in Smyrna, and what we really see is that this church is economically poor. They don't have a lot of resources, but man, they're spiritually rich. They're enduring faithfully in the midst of slander and persecution from Jews. Like they're suffering hard, and and there's even some threats of impending imprisonment and death, and Jesus is saying, hey, just continue, keep going, and I will give you the crown of life as he affirms them. Now, this crown of life thing is interesting, because in the city of Smyrna, their uh, main goddess and their main kind of symbol for the city was a crown. And here Jesus is going, I'll give you the true crown, (laughs) In fact, in each of these seven cities, there's something very specific to the context of the city that Jesus ties in, which is so cool to me, right? Because he's saying, I I know, I know your situation, and I know your background, and I know your story, and I know what you're struggling with. I know you. I am your good shepherd. I know my sheep. And and y'all, if you, you would just hear him saying the same to you today, like, I know you, right? We heard this last week. He's the shepherd. I know, Jesus says. Smyrna gets nothing but commendation. There's no rebuke. So we move to church number three, Pergamum, which is a bit of a mixed bag. Pergamum basically was withstanding persecution in the middle of like a satanic hotbed of secularism and idolatry. They're in a tough environment where everyone's going against Jesus, the other direction. But, here's the negative, they were allowing some spread of false teaching. There's pockets of people that were kind of holding on to this slippery slope idea that, hey, God's full of grace, so it doesn't really matter that much if I compromise here and here and here and here. And they were loose. They stopped pursuing holiness in kind of the mindset of like, it's all okay. Jesus is full of grace. (laughs) And it led to some loose sexual sin. They failed to step in as a church and discipline this false teaching and protect the sheep. And Jesus says, if you don't, I'm going to intervene myself. I will expose and I will correct this. He calls them to repent and then he promises to provide. Church 4, chapter 2, verse 18 is Thyatira. And very similarly, we see They're strong in love. This is like the inverse of Ephesus. They know how to love and they're doing all these compassionate works and they're even increasing in their love for God, but they're tolerating some bad false teaching. They're weak in truth. They're weak in theology, right? And it's leading to some rampant sexual sin and idolatry. And it's spearheaded by this woman in the church. She's calling herself a prophetess and she's kind of seducing these people in the church and they're not doing anything about it. Jesus has patiently given time for this woman to repent, and she hasn't. So judgment is coming on her, and Jesus is going to step in to protect his church. Church number five is Sardis, and we turn into chapter three, and we see them. It's, it's all negative for Sardis. Listen to verse one. This is pretty tough, and I think some of us probably need to hear it. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Ah, man, what a scathing thing to say, right? Everybody thinks you're strong. You're looking good on the outside. Your reputation is great. Maybe you're like strong, even theologically. You look like you're very holy, but on the inside, it's not matching up. You're kind of dead. You're void of the spirit. You're missing the love of community and the love of me. There's no vibrancy to your life. And you're not even aware. And it calls them to wake up. Which is really interesting because the city in Sardis had been captured twice in its history and it had these impenetrable walls and it was built into the cliffs. It was supposed to be this fortress and yet the watchmen on the wall were totally asleep. They'd been lulled into this complacent setting and, and, and these attackers crept in and took the city and he's going, hey, you, the church in Sardis are just the same. You're not alert. You're not vigilant. And you've been ransacked by sin. You're you're dead. They're in a a coma and Jesus is calling them to wake up. uh, Church number six is Philadelphia. Real quickly, it's small. It's overlooked. It's culturally powerless and unimportant. And yet, in the eyes of Jesus, they are strong. 
They're walking in unseen faithfulness. Maybe that's you. You feel unseen, but you're just heading in the right direction. I'm just going to try to keep doing what you've called me to do, Lord, even though I'm not getting recognition and attention for it. And he's going to say, hey, keep going, keep enduring. When we come to church number seven, and if you haven't been encouraged or convicted yet, look out because Laodicea is rough. Look what Jesus says, verse 14 of chapter three. <clears throat> the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Cold water is refreshing, hot water is medicinal, lukewarm, ugh, right? And in Laodicea, they didn't have any running water nearby. They had to pump their water essentially through some aqueducts five miles away. By the time their drinking water got to the city, it was ugh. <laughs> it's lukewarm. He's like, that's what you're like and you're unpalatable to me. Well, how are they lukewarm? You say, verse 17, for you say, I'm rich. I prospered. I need nothing. Let me say that again. You say, I'm good. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Yikes. You know a country like that? <laughs> right? Like, we're good. We, we kind of have all of our felt needs met. So I don't really need God that much. I mean, I have my home. My family's in pretty decent shape. My career's okay. There's some stability here. Like, why do I need God? Right? I'm pretty good. I mean, sure, I'll go to church and I'll do some of that stuff, right, culturally, but, like, I really don't feel my desperation for God. Meanwhile, like, I need nothing. I'm walking in self-sufficiency, and because I'm in self-sufficiency, I'm indifferent to the Lord. It's kind of flat, lukewarm, apathetic. Oh, man, this is scathing, this complacency of self-sufficiency. Here we see the seven churches, God giving the reviews. We wrap it up by just asking us the question, which are we? Yeah, which are we at the well, for sure, but also, which are you, personally? What is Jesus, out of these seven churches, speaking to you? What is he revealing to you today? What is he saying on his physical of your soul this morning? Where is he lovingly affirming you and where is he lovingly admonishing you? Let's go back through those seven churches and let's ask ourselves some questions. Ephesus, let's ask this question. Has my love for Jesus and his people grown cold? Is there a time that it was stronger than right now? In Smyrna, we need to ask ourselves, am I willing to suffer for Jesus without relief or do I need to adjust my expectations away from a life protected from suffering? In Pergamum, we need to ask, hey, where is there a compromise that's threatening my relationship with Jesus and my witness for Jesus? Is there things that I'm consuming in my entertainment? Is there language I'm using? Is there a sin that maybe I'm going lax with sexually or maybe my time and my attention is given to, to hobbies or politics or other escapes? I'm compromising. Thyatira, where am I being seduced by voices that are twisting scripture and justifying the idols <laughs> that I'm running to in my life? Am I unwisely tolerating certain teachings? In Sardis, do I appear more spiritual and holy to other people than I actually am on the inside, right? Is my soul and my relationship more with God more dead than alive? I think to be honest, right? Philadelphia, hey, am I persisting in this unseen faithfulness to Jesus or am I caught in the trap of needing recognition, needing position, needing attention for the devotion that I have to him? Laodicea has material comfort and stability, lulled me into self-sufficiency, indifference, and blindness spiritually. These are the questions Jesus wants us to ask and examine our hearts. What's the condition of your soul, church? As the band comes up and we 
seeing here in just a moment, I, sh- I want to point out whatever the good, whatever the bad, here's what Jesus is going to say to you. Look at the end of chapter 3, verse 18. Listen to his gracious words to us. Wherever you're at, whatever you're good and whatever you're bad, here's what I counsel you. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you might actually be rich. And white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus could cast them away right now, but he does not. He invites them in and he invites them to himself with the words of Isaiah 55. I'm the one who will satisfy the real feast. Stop running to these empty, broken wells and come to the all-satisfying water of life. Verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. He's saying, y'all, I'm telling you this because I love you. (laughs) If I didn't love you, I'd be quiet. I'd be silent. I'd just let you persist in your complacency. But I love you. And so I'm inviting you out of what does not satisfy and into what does satisfy. He wants to heal. He wants to save. He is the doctor and his diagnosis doesn't end there. There is a remedy he's inviting you to. Would you turn and trust in him and treasure him because behold I stand at the door and knock and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and I will eat with him and he with me Hmm. Jesus stands not as the homeless beggar hoping to get refuge but as the master of the house saying would you let me in as Lord if you do I will enter into relationship with you I would rekindle your love you originally had for me. I would enable you to endure suffering with my strength. I would speak truth that would give you discernment to lead you out of the traps of false teaching. I will be these things for you. This is the revelation of Jesus. Have you fallen at his feet yet, church? Maybe you haven't. Maybe you're not a believer in Jesus. Maybe even you think you are. Like we heard a testimony of a few weeks ago, years and years, decades of of being in the church and yet never surrendering and following Jesus. Maybe today is that day. You go, yeah, I need to fall at the feet of the risen, glorious Jesus. And if you already have, then Jesus is reminding you today, whether you've grown cold in your love or you're lacking some of the things that we've seen, he's reminding us today that the remedy is a revelation. The answer to our need and our problems today is not to go out and to do more for Jesus or to try harder, but is what to stop and see the risen Jesus. Every one of our problems is related to, remember we saw this last week, a breakdown in life is a breakdown in belief, a breakdown in seeing Jesus. And so let's go back through that. If you've lost your first love then you need to see again the one who is present with you walking in the midst of his church, beckoning relationship with him as the center. If you're suffering without relief, you've been hit all around you by death and by grief, then you need to see the one who died and who came back to life, who holds the keys of death in Hades. If you're compromising in holiness, then you need to see the one who has the sharp two-edged sword out of his mouth, cutting away the darkness. You need to hear the weight of his roaring voice today as the shepherd leading you away from the cliff. If you're tolerating bad teaching and you're justifying idolatry, then you need to see the Son of God whose eyes are like a fiery flame, whose feet are burnished bronze. If you're somewhat dead spiritually on the inside, then you need to see the Spirit of God hovering around the throne and with us, in us, dwelling in our midst, the life-giving presence of God. If you're weak and you're unnoticed in the world's eyes, then you need to be reminded of the Holy One who opens and shuts the door of life to you. He's given you His own name and His throne. You don't need the world's. 
And lastly, if you're indifferent and you're self-sufficient in your worldly security and material comforts, then you need the faithful and true witness whose face is radiating with light, whose hands are knocking at your heart as its rightful master. Let's behold him in his glory and pray to him now, church. Well, Jesus, we bow before you. We fall at your feet. This is what we need. We help us. Would you help us see your unfiltered glory? Open the eyes of our heart, Lord, and give us a desire, I pray, to plunge into this book of Revelation, to not stay back at a distance, to not be reserved and hesitant, but to be eager to come to you and to hear the voice of a a roaring waterfall speaking truth to us, life-giving truth, touching us with gentleness to restore us and say, fear not. Help us, Jesus, right now. Come under your lordship. Thank you. You are the one who has conquered who though you died has risen again and hold the keys now of death and Hades. We don't run to you in fear. We run to you in freedom. And we worship you now. Amen.